Next up, we have Elaine Steed, Chief Investment Officer, Tribe Global Ventures, discussing investing in B2B companies. Good afternoon, everyone. It's probably been about three years, I think, since I've la since I last gave a presentation in person and not via a Zoom call. So apologies if I'm a little bit rusty, um, but forgive me. So, Steve. Um, uh, I've known Steve and Wholesale Investor and been involved with them probably for about eight years and have presented at this forum a number of times over the years, so I'm really glad to be back. But one of the things that Steve asked me to speak about is not so much about Tribe, although I will tell you a little bit about us, but more about um, B2B and that as an investment sector and why we are so interested in it. But before I start, Tribe is a venture firm that helps B2B tech companies uh, scale up into the US and the UK. Now, I know that sounds like a very oddly specific mandate, but there is a reason for that. Um, one of the comments we hear most often from the founders that we work with is that they reached out to us because expanding into the US and the UK is an area that they are struggling with the most. It's not that they don't know what to do. They absolutely know what to do, that they have to scale up. It's that they need help with the how. And what we try to do at Tribe is not necessarily tell them how to do it, but work with them so they can solve the how in the most time efficient, cost efficient um, manner. The comment we hear mostly from the investors that we work with is why the focus specifically on B2B. And I guess that's the reason why Steve asked me to come and speak today. So B2B is an area of focus for us because we as a co-founding team know B2B innately. All three of us, myself, my co-founders Aaron Bergby and Don McKenzie, have all been involved in starting our own B2B businesses. We've all been B2B entrepreneurs. We've also got a track record um, and um, investment history in investing in B2B founders over the past decade. I personally have invested in over 80 companies. Um, a large proportion of those were in the B2B space. I've also invested in B2C, and I'll talk about that and, and why we have favoured B2B now. Um, and we've managed over about $400 million um, between us in the, in the venture capital space over the last two decades in Australia, uh, Southeast Asia, the UK, and the US. One of the, in addition to our track record in building and growing B2B businesses, one of, the, one of the other unifying factors of all three of us is that we've had some great successes and we've also all had some crushing failures. And the reason we think that is important in how we can help our founders is that having that experience helps us enable founders to not make the same mistakes we have and knowing what works helps us to enable them to accelerate their success. And that background, we think, helps to remove some of the friction that founders face, but also helps them to see around corners better, which we think helps mitigate risk. Now, one of the key, there's a, a couple of key tailwinds that we think also sits behind B2B as a vertical, which is important uh, for you guys to know about, I think, as you're considering this as a space to invest in. So one is that the supply-demand dynamics we think are quite favourable for B2B. So these graphs here are from um, the NC, uh, in NBCA statistics for 2021. And what they show is, what this graph doesn't show is that B2B now outpaces B2C in terms of the quantum of capital that's being deployed into that sector. That was not true 10 years ago. And there's some good reasons for that, and I'll talk about that in a moment as well. But what we're seeing now is while that outpaces B2C about two to one in terms of capital availability, it also is contracting at a lower rate than what we've seen with B2C, um, particularly as the market has corrected over the last couple of years. What that actually means is that there is quite a bit of capital availability for B2B. And while that ends up being a bit of a double-edged sword, where there's more capital, sometimes that drives up competition and that can drive up valuations and make it more difficult to get great returns. What the graph on the right-hand side shows is that in that early stage space, it's still relatively um, uh, uncompeted 
for, for capital. And that's the space that we operate in. Certainly, we invest in companies that have got product market fit and they've got some traction here in Australia or New Zealand, but they haven't yet scaled up into these international markets. And that's still, by and large, considered early stage on a global scale. What we like about this supply-demand dynamics is that it means that for the companies we do support, the ability to provide follow-on capital in subsequent rounds is pretty strong. And again, that helps us to mitigate risk. And to the point about whether or not this capital availability is um, providing that double-edged sword and driving up valuations, and someone alluded to this in an earlier presentation, we're not actually seeing that play out. And in fact, with the market correction over the last couple of years, we're actually seeing uh, revenue multiples trading well below the median. And if you do believe that eventually market forces will mean that those revenue multiples will trend back towards the median, then there's some opportunity for value and, um, and valuation arbitrage that's still available within this sector. And we're not likely to be overpaying for companies. A couple of other things that I think are probably important to note as well about B2B that, that we think makes it a very attractive vertical within the venture capital space. One is that B2B companies, one of the reasons why VCs tended not to focus on B2B in the past was because the sales cycles were a lot longer. And that means it takes longer to get traction. The flip side to that, of course, is that those customers tend to be stickier and it means less churn. And less churn means that companies are spending less money trying to just end time, trying to replenish the customers they're constantly losing. We think that's a, um, a metric for capital efficiency. And again, we think this is a great risk mitigation strategy. The other is that B2B is not very sexy. Um, it's not, it doesn't tend to be the companies that people talk about at dinner parties, it tends to be pretty boring products and services. But the flip side to that is that they tend to be less faddish and they tend to have a longer product arc or a, or a relevance arc. And for venture, which is patient capital that, that takes five to seven years to really deliver that returns, we think B2B is perfectly positioned for venture because of that. The other is that when business invests in a product or a service, they're doing it because they can see the return on investment. And where products or services can deliver value for businesses, they can continue to charge a high margin. It also means that their product tends to be less discretionary. And that means that it's less uh, vulnerable to some of the economic conditions that we've seen recently, um, which again is a great risk mitigation strategy. The last is that B2B businesses tend to be able to generate revenue from the get-go. Businesses are prepared to pay for a product or a service straight away if it delivers value to them. B2C companies tend to need to build scale before they can begin to monetize. And that's another reason why we like B2B so much. Lastly, um, while all of those things are great and enable us to make, well, to invest well, the other and the other side of that coin is that you also need to be able to exit well in order to deliver good returns for investors. And this graph here shows the M&A sector. This is a, a European data. Um, uh, this is European data. And what it shows is that the M&A sector is actually really fertile at the moment for B2B companies. Exits in the B2B space tend to be more straightforward than what we see in the B2C space tends to be just um, an exit via acquisition and there's a much greater universe of companies that are potential acquirers for B2B businesses. And again, this is another risk mitigation strategy that we think bodes really well for the B2B sector. So our investment focus therefore is really focused on B2B companies, in particular tech-driven B2B companies the tech element, as we've heard other presenta presentations say today, is what helps to drive that scale. Uh, with companies that have a proven product market fit, they've got people to pay for their product or their service, and now they're just really looking to expand into other markets. The secret sauce here is that what most companies find is that what works here in Australia and New Zealand does not necessarily translate 
to what will work in the UK and the US. We've all had experience in our team doing that and helping founders actually unlock what actually works in those individual markets. So we help in all the ways that I talked about before. Part of it is actually providing support in market. We've spent the last two decades of our careers developing connections into those markets, which are helpful. We've got a starter group of people that we can put around a company as soon as it lands into new markets. We actually take founders to the UK and the US to put them in immersion programs to help them understand what will work, what won't work, and whether it is actually the right fit for them. We also uh, offer strategic support. Every VC in the world does that. I'm not going to pretend that that's particularly um, differentiated, but we really do roll up our sleeves and help founders, um, not just with the what, but the how. And we have some um, proprietary programs that allow that. We also do focus on founder psychology and, and performance. Aaron Birkby has spent the last five years of his career actually developing these programs, delivering them into big corporates like Google and others, and we've now tailored that for the founder market that we support. Again, this is just a, real, a rehash of what I've talked about, but the way we feel that we bias returns is by investing where there's market tailwinds and not investing in against the headwind, which um, is easy to say, but not so easy to do. We really do have quality deal flow. We invest in probably 5% of the deals that we see at the moment. And despite being relatively under the radar, we have fantastic deal flow. We've done three deals in the last three months, actually. So um, that that's actually, we're really pleased with how that's performing. We, we do feel that we add real value. We won't invest unless we think we can actually help the founders and actually do something above and beyond just being an investor on their cap table. If we can't, then we won't invest, even if it's a great company, because our investors pay us to move the dial for those companies. And as I mentioned before, we're really focused on pathways to exit. We identify and develop them from the minute that we make an investment. As I mentioned, we do take founders on immersion programs. We're actually running one next year in June for London Tech Week. We're actually going to expand this one to investors who are interested in that as a market. So if anyone is interested to learn more about that, um, feel free to either scan the QR code or come up and have a chat with me at the drinks afterwards. And lastly, if you want to hear a little bit more about the deals that we offer to our investors and, and what we're seeing in the market, we do do a lot of newsletters and information sharing as well. There's another QR code that you can pick up on there as well. With that, I'll say thank you.